This remake is half done, and I don't like leaving things unfinished. So I'm just going to get this done and then move on. Most I need to do is just rewrite some parts of the original script and record it before editing it down with copyright free background music. After that I'll move on to working on Injustice Year 3's video essay. And I have also decided to wait until the second half of Batman Long Halloween is out before reviewing the entire movie. To some outsider who just came across this video randomly, go watch the remake review of Batman Child of Freeze Volume 1 before going any further with this video. The fact that the title says Volume 2 should be a dead giveaway that you need to watch something else before this anyway. Without any further delays, this is Volume 2 of Kia Asamiya's 2003 be written and drawn Batman manga known as Child of Dreams. Which after two decades should have been given an anime adaptation already. Took. The second half of the manga opens with Batman and Commissioner Gordon discussing the circumstances of the quick retrieval of Nagai's remains back to Japan. An action which has taken away the final piece of evidence from the fanatic investigation. Gordon admits not wanting to risk an international incident by fighting the Japanese ambassador, to which Batman retorts by declaring them already having an international incident, which he has to now deal with. We then jump 24 hours ahead to Tokyo, Japan, and the offices of Kanto Television where our heroine Yuko is returning to work. Her mood is still down after her request to complete her Batman report being denied, and about this anime girl-eyed colleague of hers having received her previously held anchor position. Which she is bitter about, but doesn't make a number about it, knowing she needs to keep low profile in order to keep her job. Returning to her home, we are shown that Yuko's Batman fangirling extends to just having this framed Batman poster, showing that she is not an obsessed otaku and is written more restrained than some other examples compared to which her talking to this frame poster feels mild. Taking a nap, Yuko dreams in flashbacks of the night from her childhood and the exact point where her fangirl must have spawned out of. Long story short, it is her as a little girl with her parents in Gotham about to be mugged and then being rescued by Batman. Which is where in the original video I began to question the age difference between the two, Yuko is in the later scene of the manga revealed to have been a third grader in this flashback, which should place her age to be somewhere between 9 or 10 years old depending on if her birthday was on the spring or fall, and if Bruce Wayne was, as I checked from my copies of Frank Miller's Year 1 and Scott Snyder's Year 0, 25 years old when he began his career, then Batman in this manga would be somewhere in his late 30s. If Yuko were to be in her early to mid 20s, then the age gap between them is comparable with this situation. Time, when I become an adult, I'm gonna marry you. Of course, of course. When you become an adult? Promise! Of course, of course. Only chan I've become an adult. So I get married. <laughs> what? what? Are, are you serious? Terribly oh. serious. Hey! Where are you touching? Or let's just call them two consenting adults and call it a day. Anyway, Yuko wakes up from her daydreams to quickly watch the evening news before actually going to sleep, and learns that Bruce has arrived to Japan, as Senpai said he would, as his business dealings involve a meeting with Tomioka Pharmaceutical, which is owned by Yuko's uncle Kenji. Going to sleep, Yuko hopes to get time from Bruce's obviously busy schedule, and a phone call in the morning makes that wish come true. Even when she has overslept, Yuko manages to get to work looking presentable and learns from her superiors that Bruce had requested her to cover his visit in Japan. Reuniting with Bruce who treats her friendly, Yuko shares with her senpai about how her work situation is now after Nagai's actions in Gotham and appreciates how Bruce is being a friend to her. Bruce then reveals that he is going to help boost Yuko's career by taking her with him to his meeting at Tomioka Pharmaceuticals to do a close-up covered exclusive report. Yuko's reaction is understandable. When they have arrived at Tomioka Pharmaceuticals, Yuko asks Bruce if he has ever met President Tomioka before, which makes Bruce realize that he has never actually seen what the man looks like, just like how the readers have not seen him until now. Turns out Uncle Kenji is one of those old Japanese businessmen who happens to be good sport in letting his niece cover the business negotiations. 
The two-hour meeting concludes with Tomioka Pharmaceuticals getting exclusive Asian rights to Wayne Pharmaceuticals products, and Wayne Pharmaceuticals getting the same deal with Tomioka Pharmaceuticals products in North America. Does that sound simple enough? Because after talking business, this apparently 65 or 70 year old looking, but really 46 year old businessman decides to spend the next five pages talking about Batman. I mean, really talking about Batman. Uncle Genji talks about Batman so much that other lifelong Batman fans would get seriously turned off looking up to the character and turn their attention to anything else. After leaving the meeting, Bruce comments that he felt like they talked more about Batman than about a multi-million dollar contract. Duko, who is not exactly close to her uncle, underplays him acting strangely, but knows that while Uncle Kenji talked more obsessively about him after the meeting, she came to Gotham to meet Batman because of her job, making herself and all the other Batman fans like her look better in comparison. They quickly put it behind them and go on a dinner date at the restaurant, where Yuko tells Bruce about how she, now confirmed as a third grader, was visiting Gotham with her family and had her first encounter with Batman saving them from being mocked and or worse, which is how she became his fangirl. Bruce comments Yuko's encounter to a nightmare more than a dream, but otherwise allows Yuko to finish her story about it as well as how she wanted to make a news report about Batman to make more people see him like she does. It is an oversight on how realistically coming across Batman, even as someone who would be rescued by him, could theoretically be the worst day of your life for obvious reasons. After she is done, Bruce shares with Yuko a similar experience he had at a similar age, which I don't need to describe as anyone who knows anything about Batman should know what it is. Yuko reaches to hold her senpai's hand, after which they call it a night. The following day, Yuko and her camera crew follow Bruce to his inspections of all his Tokyo businesses, which apparently include a factory tour and ends with a talk show appearance. During that last one, we are shown that someone is reporting about them to someone. Once that is all done, Bruce and Yuko are shown at another date on a different restaurant, where Bruce brings his curiosity on why it took him as an outsider to help Yuko get back ahead at work when her uncle was sponsoring her show. Yuko's answer seems to be related to the Japanese honor system or something like that, where Naga's actions in Gotham had disgraced everyone in her crew and her relationship with Uncle Kenji not being very close. What follows next is them talking about the 15-year success story of Tomoyoka Pharmaceuticals history. It is quite large to summarize along with Bruce's commentary, and based on this panel on its fourth page, it is meant to be an example of how helping Yuko was not among Uncle Genji's priorities. The scene then cuts away to Tomioka Pharmaceuticals' top secret research department, where a pair of scientists are working on a guy's cut off hand and attempting to extract Batman's DNA from it. Then when we return to Bruce and Yuko, it has become clear to everyone but Bruce that his questions have killed the mood of their day to Yuko's frustration. After Bruce has given Yuko a ride to her apartment, she unloads her emotions by yelling at her large teddy bear about how badly their date ended and how she was expecting to let Bruce stay over for the night. This is also the moment in rewriting this script for this remake review, where I want to point out that Yuko is drawn in both volumes very beautifully as a female character. There is the in-story reason for it as her job description as a weather girl and a news anchor require her to look good on camera, but despite that, Yuko is never drawn in a sexualized way in a provocative position or situations, as in when it comes to her, there is no need for any fan service to make her look more appealing. She is just written so well. And that same someone reporting about Bruce's press tour is shown standing outside of her apartment building. Meanwhile, at the Imperial suite of Tokyo Waldorf Hotel, Bruce is conducting his own investigation by hacking into Kanto television servers for Nagai's employee files. Once he runs into encrypted files inaccessible remotely, Bruce realizes that it's time to do some legwork as Batman. On site, Batman learns that Nagai was heavily in debt but had a life insurance among his assets. While still on the prowl, Batman breaks into Gogukoji insurance company where the policy for Nagai's life is held and copies the needed files for further inspection. Once the morning comes, Yuko is shown to be due to a follow-up interview with her uncle Kenji about the business deal with her senpai without a chance to see him that day. The distant uncle, on the other hand, has sent a car for her. 
Continuing from the previous night's investigation, Bruce learns more about Nagai's debts and life insurance of 100 million yen, painting a clearer picture on what happened in Gotham. The debts and the life insurance were both the same amount, meaning that upon his death, Nagai's debts were bound to be marked as paid, so he did everything he did knowing he was a dead man walking. And when digging even deeper, Bruce learns that both the loan company Nagai owed money to and Gokugoji Insurance to be subsidiaries to Tomioka, meaning that Nagai's life was always at Tomioka's mercy as a connection hidden in plain sight. We then jump over to Duko's not very clear point of view as she does not remember coming back to her apartment, only that she had a dinner with her uncle Kenji after the interview. Yuko's confusion and holes in her memory are fitted by a note and a gift left by her uncle, with excusable reasoning, but Yuko is not shown to be very well. The gift from Uncle Kenji is however not medicine for her current condition, but rather some sort of clothes. And at the same moment when Yuko opens her gift, she is delivered on another gift from her Uncle Kenji. A pet cat whose presence causes Yuko to feel dizzy again and lose her consciousness. If this was a completely different genre of manga, I would be extremely worried about our heroine's maidenhood. The elusive man from Volume 1 is next shown giving a speech to an unseen audience about the upcoming field test of what he calls the DNA bell, as a familiar Gotham silhouette races to pour at the full moon. Carrying on with his investigations, Batman observes Nagai's Japanese funeral being only attended by his family, with his old camera crew, Tomioka, and his people keeping their distance away from them. When pondering for his next move, Batman is approached by a herd of cats, followed by a Catwoman. Batman is not exactly surprised seeing this Catwoman as the herd of cats practically telegraphed her arrival. What he is unsure of is the authenticity of this Catwoman, whom he is quick to learn not to be Selina Kyle when speaking to her by name. Even when she moves with the speed and the agility of the original, Batman is smart enough to know that the real Catwoman wouldn't have no reason to stray all the way from Gotham to Japan, and that it was only the matter of time before more imposter villains would start popping up again. They fight across the rooftops of the Tokyo skyline, glimpsed by a cliched night shift worker or two, and no way this line of dialogue would get past today's SJW and feminist censorships, even when it's meant as a burn. Their battle eventually leads them to landing down on the street level, where Batman is forced to admit to himself that this Catwoman is better and more dangerous than the Catwoman he knows. Probably because this was around the same time Ed Brubaker had begun to write his Catwoman solo series, where she was more of an anti-hero than a villain. Dodging her whip causes Batman to get somewhat confused in keeping track where this Catwoman is moving. When she gets a little too cocky however, Batman is able to sweep her off her feet and a convenient truck driving by also gives him a chance to do a tactical retreat while also placing a tracker on her. The Catwoman retreats as well. Before Batman decides to go follow her, he calls Alfred back home from the Batmobile to check on whether he has been able to synthesize an antidote to fanatic traders they got. He has not. And with the imposter Catwoman running around, Batman can only hope that an antidote already exists somewhere out there where the fanatic is being produced to save this Catwoman from ending up as a mummy. When he then looks up where the imposter Catwoman has retreated to, the tracker's location places her in Yuko's neighborhood in Mejiro. After breaking the speed limits without being seen, Batman arrives at Yuko's apartment to find it in a worse state than my brother's place when he had a project going on. The imposter Catwoman is seemingly going through a withdrawal where her eyes seem to have changed shapes. Batman addresses to her as Yuko in trying to reach out to her, and she charges at him with one more attack. But Batman is stronger than her now that the drug she has been on has lost its effects and unmasks her to confirm she is indeed Yuko. Once Yuko has become lucid enough, Batman explains to her his suspicions of what has happened to her, that her uncle Kenji must have drugged her while also hypothesizing that the fanatic use on Yuko must have been done from a perfected version with an antidote coexisting with it. Understanding the situation, Yuko realizes that she has been used as a bait once again, and asks Batman not to go into a trap, but Batman refuses to let Yuko die from fanatic's after effects. As he exits Yuko's apartment, Batman comes across the cat that Yuko had been sent earlier, and recognizes its color to have a camera on it. After Batman destroys the camera, we are shown confirmed evidence that Genji Tomioka is the elusive man from Volume 1, looking at the static and eagerly waiting for Batman to arrive. 
And here is where the spoiler alert stays unmoved from its place. If you wish to experience the rest of the story, especially Yuko's fate and Batman's confrontation with Tomioka by reading this on your own, skip to this time code for my final thoughts. There is however one thing revealed in there about Tomioka that I will have to talk about later. Yatsu. Charging over to Tomioka's residence, Batman considers his options as well as Tomioka's motivations for his actions. When he does arrive there, Batman is led to a large office complex behind the residential buildings to a spotlight set on both sides of the driveway, which go on as the Batmobile approaches and go off in passing. At the end of the line, Tomioka welcomes Batman to his home with a loudspeaker directing him to leave the Batmobile and enter the office complex. Entering the interior, Batman is introduced to his biggest fan's collection of Batman paraphernalia that would put the most dedicated otakus to shade. The museum, if you want to call it that, is filled with replicas of different bat suits, batarangs, batmobiles, and then there is also the DNA vials of Batman's rogues gallery, used to create the imposters in Volume 1, as well as Batman's own DNA scrap from under Nagai's fingernails. Tomioka's otaku levels then get even higher when he expresses the want to add Batman himself into his collection, and taking himself over his work afterwards. During Tomioka's commentary, Batman is eventually led to a perfect replica of the Batcave built as a set inside the building. Perfect, as in it was copied from the footage Tomioka was able to get from the camera in Yuko's necklace. Now that the tour has come to an end, Tomioka makes his appearance to appear before Batman in his own modified Batsuit, moving faster than Batman can react to at first. Now face to face with Tomioka. Batman demands for the antidote to fanatics so he can save Yuko's life, but Tomioka reveals that there is no need for one. The latest, perfected form of fanatic that Tomioka calls the DNA Bell was created from its earliest form as a cure to the sickness Tomioka has been suffering from. Progeria, which is an extremely rare autosomal dominant genetic disorder which causes premature aging, in some cases 6 to 10 times faster than normal. Therefore, Tomioka appeared to be 65 to 70 years old when he is supposed to be 46. And that is also why the imposter plants in Volume 1 ended up dying the way they did, as they were likely aging to death from an imperfect progeria medicine. Yuko had been given a minimal injection of what Tomioka himself took from the final test amount of, and has now retained his youth. Batman passively congratulates Tomioka for his achievement, acknowledging it being a miracle, but cannot allow Tomioka to observe his mission, which had apparently been Tomioka's end goal. Every humanitarian act that Tomioka Pharmaceuticals had done during the last 15 years had been to cover his activities curing his progeria and to take Batman's place, because he doesn't want to see Batman age into a second-rate superhero. Yeah, Tomioka is one of those Batman fans, and as they say, you should never meet your heroes. When Batman confronts his obsessive behavior and points out how he used his own knees as a guinea pig, Tomioka just brushes it off by calling Batman an old man trying to avoid a fight. As for using Yuko as a guinea pig, Tomioka justifies it as a favor in allowing Yuko to become her favorite villain in Catwoman, to which Batman reacts by gritting his teeth. Before going forward with the synopsis, this is what I use to explain Batman's characterization in my Batman the Superman Dawn of Justice Ultimate Edition Review 2. He is clearly a man with a mission, but not out of vengeance. Bruce is not after a personal revenge. He is much bigger than that. He is much more noble than that. He wants the world to be a better place, where a young Bruce Wayne would not be a victim. In a way, he is out to make himself unnecessary. Batman is a hero who wishes he didn't have to exist. Frank Miller in 1986, according to David Masuchelli's afterward in Batman Year One. That should perfectly draw a picture why Batman is not pleased with Tomioka, what he has done, and what he is planning to do. Eventually Tomioka draws the first blow and they begin to fight, however Batman's continued attempt to reach out and explain how just physically becoming someone else without their experience to drive them, does not make them better as Tomioka sees them. Even with free will, they would still be imposters. And speaking of the imposter villains, Tomioka says that he found them as his villains admirers from websites, chat rooms, and appreciation societies. Kind of dated dialogue, today it would have been Facebook groups or Discord servers, whom he then manipulated into taking fanatic and living the rest of their days as their admired villains. <laughs> 
この時代の日本は勝21世紀のゴッサムか悪党どもをまとめて21世紀に戻さなければこのまま城へ突入するおめでとうポルナレフ妹の敵は撃てたし最初から知っていたらな場所へ無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無駄無
the end. Okay, first things first. Why is there no anime of this manga? The original Japanese publication happened in 2000, and the translated version was released in 2003. Batman Child of Dreams has existed for two decades by the making of this video, and so far DC and Warner Bros. Japanese branch has not made any anime adaptations of it. The only Batman animes we have gotten so far have been that indirect The Dark Knight trilogy tie-in movie Gotham Knight, and that Batman Ninja movie, which was nothing but fan service by having Nightwing, Red Hood, Red Robin, and a totally out of character written version of Damian Wayne's Robin in it, working with Batman without a story or themes to give it any rewatch value. On the other hand, in Batman Child of Dreams, the theme is in both volumes the dreams of children who have not grown up. As it was hinted in the introduction and revealed in the spoiler section, Genji Tomioka suffered from progeria, a genetic disease that can cause people to age faster than usual, sometimes 6 to 10 times faster. Because of his disease, Tomioka could be seen as having aged faster than others, and so forced into growing up without a chance of having enjoyed his childhood. I don't know how progeria affects people mentally, but by being forced into growing up while also knowing that you will die earlier than others, should give Tom Yoka the pressure he had in the story, in regaining the control of his life and what to do with it. His pressure pushed him into his work, making Tom Yoka Pharmaceuticals to be the powerful company it is, along with trying to find a cure to his progeria with Fanatic and the human experiments conducted with the imposter villains. With these factors, Kenji Tomioka is a strong and perfectly motivated antagonist for Batman to go against. And that Frank Miller quote, I'll just showcase it here so you can pause and read it yourself, spells out why Batman cannot sanction what Tomioka has done and wants to do next. No matter what you think of Frank Miller now, as back in 1986 he was obviously more clear-headed than he has been after writing the Dark Knight Strikes again. On the other side of the scale there is Yuko's character arc. After Nogai's dishonorable actions in Gotham, she is shown to be barely holding on to her job and needs to keep her head down. Eventually, with Bruce's help, Yuko manages to get her next chance at fixing her career, and then she is turned into the imposter Catwoman by being used as a pawn to lure Batman into a trap. However, this action does not turn Yuko into a victim, as prior to being turned into the imposter Catwoman, she is shown as a strong character with flaws in her field of expertise. And after her episode as the Imposter Catwoman is over, Yuko is once again shown to have gone back to work and going strong at it. We don't see her off as a victim, we see her off at the end of her character journey. Also in contrast to her uncle Genji's Batman fanboyism, Yuko's fangirling is established early on in volume 2 to be more restrained. And those factors make Yuko Yagi a stronger female character than what current day writers have done with other strong female characters. If she was written by any other writer from today's SJW climate, like Tom King for example, Yuko wouldn't have needed Bruce's help in getting her career back on track, and she would have been written to have gotten Catwoman's abilities to fight alongside with Batman when he goes to face off against her uncle Kenji which would have been a complete overkill on her previously established strengths. As I called them in the video of Volume 1, the difference between dreams and fantasies is that dreams can come true by balancing them with the reality and our own driving the ideals, which is exactly what Yuko did by becoming a more serious news anchor in the end by rebuilding her professional dream, which had been destroyed in Gotham thanks to Magai. Her uncle Genji achieved his dream too in curing his progeria, but as it was shown in the spoiler section, he symbolically flew too close to the sun in trying to make his fantasy a reality too. Once again, well done Asamiya-san. This manga is amazing in both its art and the story being told in it. I'm going to skip through asking you to like the video, comment your thoughts down below, and going straight into SHARE THIS VIDEO TO MORE PEOPLE TO WATCH. Why has this manga not been turned into an anime yet? Why did they make that Batman Ninja movie, which was nothing but fan service in having every Robin in it with a story better fit for a video game? Seriously, either share this video or try make Batman Child of Dreams more known 
so that it gets more recognition. And maybe some animation studio in Japan will give it the anime adaptation it should have gotten instead of that Batman Ninja movie. And subscribe for my next upcoming videos, and may your heart be your guiding key.